Good morning to each and every one. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for joining with us in our Sunday school lesson here at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Manor, South Carolina, by whatever means of technology that you are joining us with. Eternal God, our Father, we come once again at this moment to say thank you. We ask you now, O oh God, for a fresh and none of the Holy Spirit. Shower me, O oh God, with your blessing that your word might be taught with clarity and with understanding, and that your people might receive it in your days to come to be better disciples of you. O oh God, bless each and every one. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we will give you this praise. Amen. Our lesson is lesson number two for the week of January the 14th, 2024. <clears throat> Excuse me. The subject is faith and trust. <clears throat> Excuse me. The subject again, faith and trust. The background passage of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. The lesson passage for study is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. The unifying topic, wise beyond your years. The lesson text is divided into two parts. The first part is preserving and the preserving the teaching of the Father. Proverbs chapter one, verse one through chapter three, verse one through four. The second part, a heartfelt trust. Proverbs chapter three, verse five through eight. The main thought: trust in the Lord with all in our hearts, and lean not unto thy own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 from the King James Version of the Scripture. The unifying principle. We get into trouble when we think we have all the answers. Where can we look for trustworthy guidance? The writer of Proverbs called us to humility, acknowledging God's authority in our life instead of relying solely on our own instincts. Lesson aim. Adult Christians deepen their faith by trusting in the Lord more than in their own insight. Mature Christians have grown spiritual because of life events and circumstances that have, that have, in many cases, forced them to depend and rely upon the Lord. This lesson provides a message of support and encouragement to, to delve deeper into the faith, knowing that the Lord is always in control. Life aim. Christian approaches a new sense of wholeness in life when they run away from evil. One of the most difficult entities a believer's face, especially a new Christian, is the lure of the old crowd that tend to entice and no vice to return to old habits. Paul encouraged a person who may be tempted to put away from yourself the evil person. First Corinthians chapter uh, five and verse 13. God's word in life. Adults honor God in their daily living as they turn to God for insight. Honoring God is not a simple thing, but it's a lifestyle and a thought process that must be cultivated. Psalm 34 and 3 serve as an example that honor is due to God. Stating, O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. For the believer to reflect this command, he or she must Realize that it requires wisdom <clears throat> and virtue. Daily living is continuous living, and therefore a constant walk with God must occur as we turn to him for discernment. <clears throat> Excuse me. The introduction. The book of Proverbs is considered to be written by Solomon. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 1. However, if he did not, after the entice the entire book, he is credited with assembling the corpus and being its main contributor. 
These collect the same are designed to provide inspiration and practical guidelines to a believer everyday lifestyle. On the overriding themes of the book is wisdom. While not displaying a tourist outside of a connection with God, chapter 3 begins with the exaltation about the importance of teaching with, uh, which moves to trust and to encouragement to honor God. In this case, there is definite benefit for one who walks with the Lord. Notice that these verses follow an alternating pattern of commands and rewards. Command 1 in verse 1. Reward in verse 2. Command again in 3. Command in 4. Command verse 5 and 6a. Reward verse 6b. Uh, command verse 7. Reward 8. Command verse 9 and reward 10. Proverbs will not only benefit the simple, but also the wise. <clears throat> this lesson, as we begin this year, and they all, this quarter talks about faith. Last week, our lesson was, subject was from Hebrew chapter 11 which began in telling us that faith was the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And that subject was faith and righteousness. Today, our lesson moved back to the Old Testament and shared with us about faith, faith and trust. Faith, you have to trust. And as I said, faith has to have, a, have an object, and the object should be God. So here we look at this lesson today, and it talks about faith and trust. But the, as they say, the theme of this in, in throughout uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 3, it talks about the wisdom of God. And James said, if anyone likes the wisdom, who they should ask? They should ask God. So when we look at this first part, when it talks about preserving the teaching of the Father, I just want to talk, uh, share a little bit when it talk about wisdom. Wisdom. What is wisdom? The word wisdom journal coordinates such ideas as skill, experience, knowledge, or good judgment. The Hebrew word in Proverbs for wisdom is kofmea, meaning wisdom, experience, shrewdness. So this word can refer to technical skill, or especially ability, but also in knowledge and ability to make the right choice at the opportunity time. This kind of wisdom based upon the fear of the Lord, according to Proverbs 1 and 7, is the type of wisdom believers should desire. That should be the type of wisdom that we de desire, the fear of the Lord. They say the first sign of wisdom well, is the fear of God. So we see here when he talks about this in this uh, lesson today. So it talk in the shares here in this first part when it say preserve the teaching pres preserving and teaching of the father verses 1 through 4 from chapter 3 and I will read from the King James Version these are the words that are recorded there my son forget not my law but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee let not mercy and truth forsake thee bind them about thy neck write them upon the tablet of thine heart thou shalt so shall thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Here, Solomon in this chapter starts out with what? Teaching. Teaching his son. And this is a father that is teaching his son. And in the responsibility of those fathers, they call us they are the priest of the household. And we are to teach our family and our children and live an example that will be pleasing in God's sight. So right there in verse 1, what it does, it instruct us, this part say, instruct us to what? Forget not my law. 
Let them, but let thine heart keep my commandment. So what he's saying there, don't forget them. What I teach you, uh, you ought to remember them. And you ought to bind them. Let them be kept at your heart. That's why he talked about write them on the altar of your heart or the tablets of your heart. So here we see what he's telling his son there in this first uh, verse about the commandment. And he said, and there's one way to keep that the son can keep his father's commandment will be to commit them to memories. You know, we got a lot of people, they can memorize things easily. They can read it a couple of times and they can memorize it. And it's a Bill Clinton was one of our uh, uh, great scholars. Uh, and he could re uh, remember those things. Read them once and he uh, could remember, wrote scholars. So here we look at this, these, and he encouraged him that what you ought to do, he said, you ought to remember them. And, 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 and commit them to memory. By doing this, he's talking about the law of Moses. He said the, the parents to teach their children about God's law. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Parents honor God when they train their children to follow God. Okay? Further, children obey God and receive blessing when they give honor to their parents. And follow the teaching that their parents teach them. So it's, it's, it's a benefit to this. And that's why he said, forget them not, my law. Talking about the law of God, the book of the, uh, uh, the law. Don't forget them, write them, bind them. And that was one of the requirements of the Jews. It would say, write them on the forehead, on your wrist, on your doorpost of your house. Well, put them where? Wherever you go that you could see them, if you didn't memorize them, they will be what? They will be a reminder. They was always in your presence. Okay? And then he, he moved to verse 2. What did he say? He said in verse 2, he said, For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now, when we look at the commandments, Ten Commandments. First four were put to God, and then when it began to fall, the mother said, it was to admit each other. It said, honor thy mother and thy father, what? that the days may be long upon the land, what? Which the Lord thy God giveth to thee. So here Solomon remind them, he said, when a child honors his or her parents, the days of that child may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth to thee. Back we find, as I just said, in Exodus 20 and uh, 12. So this is a promise. And that promise is what? Is of long life. And it's a contrast with the, with, with the promise of whoever pursued evil uh, proceeded it to death. But he said, well, follow them. And do that, and what? Your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth to thee. Okay? So he said, uh, let them know. Honor thy mother and thy father. Remember the Lord. Remember what they tell you. Be obedient to them. Then he goes on in verse 3. That's what he, he talks two things here. He said, let not mercy what, and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table of thy heart, as I just was saying. Now, what he said here, he said, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. What is he saying there? He said, mercy and truth, they are the two key words in the Old Testament, is special in regard to uh, the attributes of God. Trust God and believe in God. God has mercy. God is truth. So these are the attributes, two of the attributes of God. So when we do this, mercy, what is mercy? Mercy frequently refers to God's loyalty and commitment toward his people. Okay? So, so, so God's mercy is rooted in his faithfulness and his promises. According to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9 and verse uh, 12. Okay, First King, 8 and, tw and 23, Psalm 26 and 3. His mercy 
seeks redemption and safety for God's people. Truth conveys the idea of reliability. So we, when we see this, God has mercy. What we always do, we ask God what, to have mercy on us. Mercy is what? Compassion. It's love. It's caring. Okay? So that's why you say, uh, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. God has mercy. His mercy endures forever. Each day, his mercy is renewed for us. Day after day. So here the father concerned is not only his son behavior. The father also desired to see the son heart transformed. How is it transformed? By mercy and truthfulness and obedience to God. So here he, all the deeds he wants to see. Uh, a transformed heart will result in a change behavior. And that's what they talk about being changed. You know, well, when one said it's changed, we should see a difference. There should be a difference there. So a life that appears righteousness but lacks a rightly ordered heart is full of hypocrisy and sin. Okay? We can easily do that. So the heart deception will someday be oppressed. I mean, exposed. The father wants his son to do good. Action that come from the heart transforming the orient toward the virtue of mercy and truth. They're transforming up the heart. So we see that here. So then it say a heart filled with mercy and truth should be the foundation for the son's behavior. Not only the son, but for everyone's behavior. The foundation of it. So we see what he's saying here. So these attributes, what? They are part. They are part of God's character. So they should be part of the character of his people. Okay? And then, it, 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 then he goes on and he said, Bind them up, up, about thy neck. Write them upon the tablet, the table of thine heart. This will talk. Excuse me. To the Hebrews, that they are to do these things in the law, they, they're teaching the most. So in biblical time, necklace was signs of honor or rank. Okay, we go back in Genesis 41 and 2 in Daniel. So to bind something around one neck to reveal the importance or the significance of something. You see, many times people wear certain chains or certain necklace or even rings or something that people give them and they cherish it. And what they say, this, I will put this around my neck. And it is what? In a place of remembrance. So, the, so it is a mean that what? It is, it is important. So to bind something around one neck, it talks about the importance. The figurative language is the verse that highlights the extent that the son should go to develop a life of mercy. And faith and truth. The opposite of a life with, with, with these virtues would be considered stiff neck, rebellious, disobedient. And Jeremiah talks about that stiff neck and rebellion spirit. So then he goes on and say, uh, He commanded them to write mercy and truth upon the, ta the table of thine heart. Is another example of figurative language. This first also alludes to do the Romans. I said earlier, God command the people of Israel to eternalize his law, to remember them. And that's what, and in, in the book of Psalms, David said, well, write them well upon thy heart, well, that I will hard them. Well, upon thy heart. Because if you memorize scriptures, or some scripture, we should rememorize, and that when Satan attacks that, we can quote or uh, we can quote God's word, you know, because it he attack you sometimes when you don't have your Bible with you and you can't run and look and find a scripture and read. You need to have something <laughs> in your heart. They will hide that word in thy heart. No, that I might do what? That I might not sin what against thee. So when you can tell Satan, flee from me. I am a child of God. I am covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Satan don't want to hear that. 
But when he comes jumping on you and you don't have nothing to defend, you just curl over. Then he takes advantage of you. So that's why he encouraged him here to take these and write them and eternalize them and remember them. Some such lives are declared to be epistle of Christ, though God's spirit. Okay. And then the last part, verse in part one say, he said what? So shall thy find favor and good understanding. What? In the sight of God and man. Okay? To find favor. What mean to find favor? To find favor in a person means to hold that person in high regard. Okay? For an example, in Daniel 1 and 9, even children, when they follow God, can receive favor from other people and God. Okay? To have a good understanding signify character and integrity of insight that we might know about God and that he can help us and we will have an understanding about that and that we can live this life and this character is developed only when one seeks wisdom and seeks after God and his law and his word then what we are developed that is a developing spirit of maturity and develop it into keeping his law as Solomon uh, instructs the son in verse 1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandment. He's saying when you study them and keep going over them, recite them, recite them, you keep going over them, little what, daily by daily and practice what, eventually it will become a lifestyle. Okay? As you, you know, there are I say a lifestyle. But people can easily pick up different lifestyles. You take kids at an age of learning, young age, they see other kids doing things. They don't know whether it's right or, or not. But they will pick up that pattern because what they what? Because of what they see someone else is doing. Okay? I, I, you, take, you take children. When they're growing up, the youngest one, if you see the older one, when he doesn't know, or he, when he or she doesn't know any better, when they see the older sibling doing something, what, they will try to do the same thing. Let, let one of them come and get up there and walk across there. That young one can be down here. He don't know how the sibling got up there, but he will try from here to try to get up, not no, go around and take the steps and go, but he just want to get there. And that will, it become a, a, a pattern. So he's just saying that all patterns are not good, but it can become a lifestyle. Okay? So that's what he, he's saying here. So when we look at these and follow these uh, good patterns, we can gain wisdom from God. And then we can remember his laws. We can remember his commandment. We can write them on the tablet of our heart. We got a lot of people, there were certain psalms. Say like Psalm 23, most people can quote that, okay? They know the psalm, but they don't know, they don't know the psalm. They, they don't know who, who the shepherd is. When they talk about the good shepherd, they really don't know what, the, but they just can quote it. Like the Our Father Prayer. We are taught that word at a young age. And what? It's written upon our hearts. How a parent taught it to us on a nightly basis. And we had to learn it. We had to learn it. We still know it. Even in school. They don't do it now. You go to school. I was in school. They had devotion. You had to say a Bible verse every morning. And you couldn't say the same one over and over. And the teacher got tired of you saying Jesus wept. <laughs> Most of everybody know that one. What I'm saying, they were things that were taught. And what they were doing, they were developing them on the table of our hearts. Why? Because you were young then. We had to recite what? The preamble to the Constitution. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. All of these things, well, we learned them. And most of us, if our mind hadn't started drifting, <laughs> we could yet remember them. Okay? The Gettysburg Address. All of these things I'm saying because we were taught 
And what we were obedient to the instructors, the teacher. There were things that it's sad to say, but it's truth. That these politicians want to take our school now and don't want to teach the kids. You know, it's sad. They need to know these things. So what it's our responsibility as a church and as parents to teach them. We had to learn the, the 50 states. At that one time of 48, then there came uh, uh, Alaska, and then Hawaii. And then we had to learn what? The capital of them. South Carolina has 48 counties, 46, 46 counties. I was in fourth grade, Ms. Dingham. I had to learn, we had to learn them in alphabetical order and the county seat. Abbeville, Allendale, Aiken, right on down the line. Bamber, Buford, right on down the line. We had to learn them all. So, but now they, they look at that, the timetables. I asked my granddaughter one time, Shanae, do y'all, uh, do they teach y'all timetable in school? What's that, Grandpa? You know, but we had to learn that. The timetable from 1 to 12. And I like the math. I learned them all the way up to 15. You know, but what they're doing, they were teaching you. And this is what Solomon is saying here. It's to teach. It's a responsibility that we have. And he started out saying, my son. And that's what good parents does for their kids. Let's move on. Okay. The second part say, a heartfelt trust. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. And we hear this quote so many times. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. And lean not unto thy own understanding. And verse 6 says, In all thy ways, acknowledge him and what? And he shall direct thy path. That's true. That's true. So what does he point out here? He said, We tend to place trust in things and people rather than to put our trust in God. Huh? So many times we put trust in other things. Materialistic things. And one of the things that a lot of people put trust in and, all we, and, and believe other than God. Just go around any of these little small stores and see the line. Plain numbers. Give me that number over there. They, they, own, they got them up there. Got them. The whole backbone. And they tell them, give me number this, give me number 10, give me number 20, whatever it is. And I'm saying, and they're struggling, but they believe that what? I'm going to win something instead of trust God who will provide for us. But what? They believe in things rather than believe in God who will make a way for them. That's how, they, you know, and that, 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 that's, that's human nature. You know? I'm, I'm not, I'm haven't always been where I am now. We all have done things. But we should learn. We had one guy back in <laughs> Connecticut, Brown. He would always come by the Bible shop. He was a good friend of the Bible, the barber, the barber. And we was in there one day, and he would always come by when he get out of work and ask him where the number was, because the barber shop was right up the street from where they were taking at that time. It wasn't up. A lot of them, they were writing them down, you know, writing them down. Well, Brown came in there that day, asked Jimmy. And every time they asked, he asked for the number, well, he would always be off by one. So Brown came in there that day. They said, uh, what was the number? So they said, they had planned. Jimmy, Joe, and Frank, his card, all that. said, we're going to get him today. Well, it was, you know, you were sitting around, you know. Brown came in there. He said, they said, what was the number? They said, ABC. He said, I played WXYZ. <laughs> he always had, but his faith and his trust was that he could hit the number. And not only that, we see it today. Other things people believe in, believe in witchcraft or astrology and all of these things, rather than believing God. But yet the scriptures tell us what? The trust in the Lord was with all thine heart, not part of it, but with all of it. And then he said, well, and lean not unto what? Thy own understanding. 
Trust God. God will make a way, y'all. I'm a living witness. So when we trust God, at best, this misplaced the trust can lead to fertility. At worst, however, it can lead to destruction. Mislead, misplaced trust does not lead to anything lasting and eternal wisdom. It's no good. But trust God. And we can quote that scripture. Trust in the Lord with all our heart. And lean on it to the all I understand. And in all our ways acknowledge him and he will direct up. That is true. But we have to carry it out what? In a lifestyle of living. We just can't memorize it. We have to do it. The reminder to lean on and put on our understand is another warning. In that regard, only foolish people. Trust themselves more than the wisdom of God. Why? Because they think they know it all. Okay? When people consider themselves to be wise in the eyes of the world, their so-called wisdom amount to foolishness in the eyes of God. So don't, 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 don't get caught up in this, in this craziness. Then in verse 6, he said, in, in, in all our ways acknowledge him. What do you mean? To acknowledge God means to know him and to give him proper recognition that I will worship him. I know him. I acknowledge God. I love him. I adore him. I admire him. He is the, the head of my life. He is my creator. He is my sustainer. He is my provider. He's my all in all. So that's what you're doing when you acknowledge him what? In all thy ways. And what? And he will direct the path. That's why he said, well, he's a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. God will direct us. But we have to trust him. Take it away from man. And trust in him. Those who submit to God can be assured that he will direct the path of life. God is all known, omniscient. God is all present, omnipresent. God is all power, or, 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 or party, or, omnipotent. So God is everything. He's all that we need. There we can trust that he will provide. He's been doing it all ever since creation. And he will still continue to do it. He hasn't stopped yet. Then when he moves to verse 7, what he say? It says, be wise in thine own eyes. The opposite of trusting in and submitting to God is to consider one's wisdom. As the final say, to be wise in thy own eye is to be sure that one's own wisdom is superior and ultimate. So God's wisdom is superior over all other wisdom. James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, who, who, do, who should we ask? Ask God. The first sign of wisdom is what? It's the fear of God. Okay? But he want us to he want us to understand that. So when people depend on their own wisdom and do what seems right to them, they are no better than fools. Okay. Proverb eighteen and two, or fools are even worse. According to Proverb twenty six and twelve, God is the source of wisdom. And desire to give his people wisdom through what? Through his spirit. That's why James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask God. Because he has it. And he can give it. And he give it what? Through his spirit. Okay? When God asked Solomon, what did he desire? What did Solomon say? Ask for. Solomon asked for wisdom. And God said that being you didn't ask for wealth 
or nothing else. He said, I will give you all of these other things because you asked for wisdom. And, Paul, and Solomon wanted wisdom for what? That he can what? Directly and guide that people and make what? The right choice. And when his wisdom was, I think, I always call it one of the high points of his wisdom checking was when the, 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 the two mothers with the baby. Y'all know the story. Oh, you heard the story, right? And they brought, the two mothers brought the baby, and each one of them claiming it. Now, some of them saying it can't be both of a child. Right? We heard the story, right? So what Solomon said, his decision was, well, cut the baby in half. You take half and you take half. What the mother said. Let her have. That's true love, right? So that was, uh, was his wisdom. He didn't argue with him so we could go back there and find out who uh, was what and that. He just cut him in half. You take half and she, the other one take half. The real, the true mother said, no, let her have. Because she would rather see her child with the, not the natural mother, than to see being deceived or being put to death. And that's wisdom. And we said that's why I said lean not in, in all that we acknowledge him. So he, he shows it. So he received wisdom from God. That's in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5 through uh, 14. However, he failed to follow God's wisdom in chapter 11, verse 1 through 8. As a result, he experienced heartaches and promise of consequence that would extend past his lifetime. And how did it extend past his lifetime? It extend in the family of his son, David. Huh? With David and his sons, Absalom and Ammon and all of them and his sister, all of them. That came, and that's why it was it by, by Solomon deterring from God in the latter part of his life, getting caught up with all these women, and got off the track of true wisdom. And what happened? But God yet stuck with it and still fulfilled his promise because he said, Well, the lineage of his son will come what through the lineage of David. And all of these things took place in Solomon's life. The, the, the kingdom was one kingdom until his son, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, then they were they divided it. It always, and that's why he said, it extended upon his lifetime. So we see all of these things that God points out in the scripture, and they are true. And then in the latter part of that verse, he said, fear the Lord, and depart what? From evil. Fear the Lord. And depart from evil. The scripture provides instinct when people were afraid of the Lord and his power. Example in Genesis 3 and 10. In this verse, however, to fear the Lord involved having an attitude of reference. Wonder, faith, and trust in the Lord. That's what I mean by fear of God. We don't fear man, but we be able to fear God. It is impossible to be wise in one's own eyes, and so tenements fear the Lord. Instead, an attitude of humility is required. Those who fear the Lord come to have a true wisdom. Why? Because wisdom, the first sign of wisdom, is the fear of the Lord. Okay? So we see this. Then fearing God and loving evil are incompatible. Fearing the Lord requires an activity turning from evil. To depart from evil involves an attitude of repentance. Okay. And then when he closed out the lesson in verse 8. It shall be health to thy neighbor. Okay. And marrow to thy bone. But on the, you look at the net, uh, new revised standard, it says, It shall be healing to your flesh and a refreshment to your body. The Hebrew used that word neighbor, which means, is a word mean of wholeness. So when it's a neighbor, talking about the wholeness 
of the body. And that's why I read the, uh, in uh, the uh, New Revised Standard, say it will be healing to your flesh and refer, refreshment to your body. So, so it's the, it, the, the neighbor meaning the wholeness of that. So by doing that, and what marrow is, marrow is the life-giving tissue located in, 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 the, in the cavities of the bones. A life of humility, fear of the law, and obedience to him result in the complete wholeness of a person. What makes one whole? Jesus saw the man. What did Jesus ask him? Do you wish to be made whole? And the wholeness means that all three have to be in sync. The mind, the body, and the spirit. That's what makes one whole. Your body could be good. Your spirit could be broken. Your mind could be bad. Okay? Those who Jesus healed, they were not whole until after his healing. That's why he asked the man, he didn't ask, do you want to just get up? Well, he said, do you wish to be made whole? So Jesus knew what? There were some other things that were lacking. All three was not in sync. It had to be, as I said, it had to be the mind. Your mind had to be good. Your body had to be healthy. And then the spirit. Then that's the wholeness. And only God is able to do that, to put all three of them in sync. And then when we know that, however, that person's status of life does not correlate to the quality of a person's heart. While people may experience. And then in the latter part, it says when we hold, then we see what it talk about in Revelation 21. All matter, sickness, disease, death, and everything, God will wipe away your tears, and all of that will be taken away. Then we know what? That has become the wholeness of man and humility. Thank you. That's what it was about. Truth and faith. Faith and trust. We have to trust God. And that verse, as we know so well and can quote so, trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean on unto all our understanding in all our ways. It said, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. And that's true. God will do that. But we have to believe it and trust it.